don't really know where to turn now. My little brother just told me about this group, and I'm guessing that this is as good a place as any. Hide in plain sight. Huh. Do with this what you will. But hopefully, the admins or whoever's in charge of this place, maybe you can archive this for future reference. So look, my name, it does not matter. Call me Jackson. I was never a bright kid, but I was fast and strong. I was always picked first for footy or basketball, but I struggled with the so-called important subjects like maths and physics. Straight out of high school, while the other kids went to uni to study science or law, I followed my family's footsteps and enlisted with the Australian Army. I didn't even bother with officer school. I drove bare bones into combat and security. What came next is not important, except to say that I seriously aced every test that they threw at me. And in February of 1999, I found myself recruited to the Aussie Special Air Service, which is basically Australia's special forces. Yes, Australia does have a special forces unit. And yes, the SAS really is the boogeyman and everything you've heard about the selection and training is true. Well, maybe we aren't forced to chew unborn babies, but the rest is pretty much bang on. In 2001, I was a member of Operation Slipper. As a member of one squadron, I formed part of a covert team conducting renaissance and surveillance of AQ and related elements alongside the US Marines from the 58 around Kandar. I was still young and able enough to treat it all like a video game. Most of the time it was quiet and I could maintain that illusion. But when shit went south, we didn't. I mean, it wasn't like a game then. In 2002, my long-range patrol vehicle hit an IED. We lost a true hero that day. In honour of his family, I won't name names, but... Google is your friend. I took what I considered minor shrapnel wounds, but I was forced to retire. Almost nobody back home knew anything about my job or my life back then. I was just the big, dumb kid that joined the army to shoot guns for fun. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but here, the military pension ain't much. I was 24. Badly scarred, mostly unemployable and totally undateable. No sweet young Sheila wants to date Freddy Krueger's bastard son. But hey, sure, I could skate through some stupid chub security course and get a license to bounce in a nightclub. Woo, career aspirations achieved, right? My cousin Joey, he was a bouncer at the Callumvale Hotel. Back in 2000... Nearly got knifed to death. A crowdfunding thing got him a wheelchair a couple years ago. Good for him, I guess. This is... so frustrating. But I've got a bit of time. So look. Pine Gap in the Northern Territory. It's like Australia's Area 51. It's not what you know, but who you know. And since I've got a fairly unique surname... Once I entered the Australian Defence Force, I had, well, kind of a guardian angel looking out for me. In the midst of my recovery, some cousin by marriage's uncle's roommate's sister's something or other, distant family member with the same surname. He's since been named in some high-profile bullshit, so I'm not going to spill names. He popped up out of the woodwork, and he offered me a basic patrol job with a private security concern. During my stint in the SASR, the older guys would often spin shit about retiring into some cruisy job with Blackwater or Nightwatch or whatever other private military mob was in the news. But, these guys are legit. They only hire ex-SAS operators. The money? That was damn good. 
urban legends between grunts, scott about ghosts earning nearly a thousand bucks a day. But shit, they are way off. So, I slid into some nepotist jackpot job, sitting out 12 hour shifts, guarding some secret satellite base in the middle of, I swear, nowhere. I found myself half a mile from somewhere between the black stump and that's roughly between Kui of Ayers Rock. Now look, I saw some shit out there in the sand pit. Not like I have anything to lose, but the coalition of the willing were all flying some crazy shit in the skies at night over there, more than 15 years ago. I mean like the stealth bombers back in the early 90s, but silent and still. These things, they slid across the sky like hockey pucks, stopping instantly and changing altitude like damn yo-yos. We grunts soon learned that, mere seconds after a flyby, we'd be radioed a zero point to hit. So, we didn't ask any questions. I mean, they might have been unarmed aerial vehicles or drones for all we knew or cared. In the grit, we didn't give a shit. Point and click, or point and shoot. It didn't matter. At the end of the day, it was target elimination by any other name. But there I was, my damn birthday 2004, subcontracted by a private military contractor. I mean, walking the rim of Pine Gap like an idiot with a gun, while nobody anywhere in the civilized world gives half a shit because hardly anyone even knows about PG-01, let alone what they're doing out here. We lowly security guards, we didn't have an ounce of clearance. But the shit I saw, I only sleep through the day now, because the night, it isn't safe. And the itching sting in my neck, that won't go away, no matter how deep I cut. I just hope someone here takes this seriously and does something with it. I don't know, hit up Julian Assange or something. He knows. He has to. Surely. I've lost men and women, friends and comrades, all to... things. Call them aliens, ghosts, monsters, or maybe even pissed off spirits of the land. I've seen hell in all kinds of war zones, but Pine Gap, that's the first and only place that has ever terrified me to my core. I'm reminded of a Shakespeare quote from high school, something like, there are more things in heaven and on earth than I dreamed of in your philosophy. I thought I knew what the world had to offer. Turns out, I didn't even know what the world consisted of. I really wanted to try to lay this out brief and brisk, but it takes a lot of backstory. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I've had a couple of days to settle down and find a hole to nest up in. I've been shown how to use a VPN, so for the moment, I think I'm as safe as can be expected. I'm sorry I cut my last entry short. I wrote it sitting in the back corner of a truck stop in Queensland, using their free Wi-Fi. And somehow, while I was typing out the first post, a black helicopter started buzzing the damn place. I've got enough cash on me that I managed to pay for a ride in the back of a refrigerated rig. It's winter here, and while comparatively it doesn't get that cold, I'm only wearing the clothes I escaped in and I was damn near frozen by the time I disembarked. But, back to the story. The first few weeks at PG-01, they were easy as pie. The security team lived in an underground city, about 500k to the east. Look up the Aussie town of Kubapiti. It was like that, but much smaller, and not on any maps, I guarantee that. There were 24 of us and we worked rotating 12-hour shifts, six guards at a time. Two hours before our shifts began, 
we would be collected in a Black Hawk helicopter and flown to a pad on the outskirts of the primary facility. It all seemed so extravagant, but since Pine Gap is ostensibly an American facility, I knew that the budget must be near limitless. I was used to living in camp-like facilities, and the men and women bunking at PG-22 were a professional bunch. I made fast friends with an Aboriginal fella named Joe Longstory Bronson, although in hindsight, perhaps friends is too strong a word. He was tall and rangy, and he would only ever speak a single word when a dozen would do. On our first night patrolling together, I asked him about his nickname. He just shrugged and replied, It's a long story, and finished rolling his smoke. I laughed it off at the time, but I soon learned that that was his response to any question he didn't want to answer. It's a long story. I could respect that. We'd all seen some shit, and the nature of the job is that you suck it up and get on with it. For better or worse, military life, especially special ops, it isn't touchy-feely. Regardless, he and I were on the same rotation. We quickly fell into an easy companionship, out there in the absolute pitch black that smothers the Aussie outback at night. I've been to most countries in my military career, but nothing matches that darkness. I was a month in, when the serious strangeness began. My bank account was already looking fatter than it ever had. The SAS paid well, but like I mentioned before, these guys, they pay obscene coin. Our perimeter, it was an odd set of loops. At its widest, it was roughly 5k, or just over 3 miles, in circumference. To the public, Pine Gap is an earth station, a ground-based radio facility used to communicate with satellites. It's a great spot for the US to build such a plant giving them constant contact with their SBA, or space-based assets, on the far side of the world. The base itself, it consists of a large central hub surrounded by 14 radomes, or radar domes, that protects radar antennae. What isn't public knowledge is the extensive underground hangars, chambers, bays and tunnels there's actually a totally self-contained subway rail system there. I mean, we've all heard about Area 51, and while there's plenty of scuttlebutt about that place, Pine Gap is definitely something else. Considering our station was in the heart of Australia, which is as large as the main part of the United States, and we held no fear of internal nor external enemies, each patrol squad was... Strangely, armed and armoured, really well. I mean, I've been on missions in Timor, Africa, in the Middle East with less kit than we had. Virtus body armour, ACRs, adaptive combat rifles made by some German mob, augmented reality headsets. I felt like I was in a video game. I figured it was money for jam. But, one hellishly hot night in late January, the middle of summer here, despite my kit, I found myself wishing for armoured support, air support, artillery support, hell, kinetic bombardment, a nuke strike, anything. The sun lingers on the horizon in the outback summertime. Temperatures regularly soared above 40 Celsius, that's around 104 Fahrenheit. In these parts, even at night. This particular evening was January 26th, Australia Day. It's a contentious holiday that commemorates the first landing of Captain Cook. Naturally, the Aboriginal people aren't too fond of it. Long story didn't give too much of a shit though. I asked him what he thought about it all as we were kidding up. He just shrugged and said, Done is done. 11.03pm. 
Despite what Hollywood may show you, secret military facilities aren't lit up like a Justin Bieber concert all night. It was dark as all hell. The Milky Way was distinctly visible, arcing from horizon to horizon. The crickets and cicadas were oddly silent. The only sound was that partially felt grunch of my boots as they walked across the gritty sand. I was approaching one of the testing pits, 30 by 30 foot, angular, squared, concrete lined depressions in the earth on the west side of PG-01. Peering out at the desert landscape through my headset, when I became aware of this weird pulsing, thrumming sound. You ever heard some bogan drive by in the middle of the night, a few streets away, booming out some bassy electronic music? That thrumming, boom, 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 with a syncopated beat hidden somewhere in the mix. That's the closest I can describe the sound, but it kind of cycled and pulsed in time with an arrhythmic pounding. Long Story was walking towards me from across the yard, and he stopped rigid in his tracks and looked out at the pits like he was zeroing in on something. I had no freaking idea where the sound was coming from, so I jogged over to him. What the hell is that, man? I asked in a desperate whisper. I don't know who else could have heard me, but I was creeped the hell out. No spotlights had come on. The radio was deathly silent, lacking even the distant, ghostly whisper of background static. I wondered if I was imagining it. Long story, usually loose and fluid in his every movement. He was locked in position. His entire 6-6 frame, almost quivering. For a split second, he reminded me of pig dogs I'd hunted with in my youth, in the moments they smelled a wallow. The whites of his eyes, they seemed to glow, as he whispered to me, One Gina. I started to ask what the hell he was on about when the bass sound collapsed like a falling building into a physically crushing sensation that went below and beyond anything I've ever experienced. It was like being slammed on all sides at once by Mack trucks. In that indeterminable moment, the deafening crash of the IED that had mashed my squad in 2002 it seemed like the distant memory of a nervous murmur. And then I saw them. Three figures. Impossibly tall. I mean, nearly ten feet were just suddenly, somehow, standing in the dead centre of EB-1. It was almost blindingly dark, but they stood against the blackness like they were spotlit. My AR headset... It had night vision amplification, but it offered no green glow. The figures appeared violently black against an impossibly white background at nearly midnight in the outback. What we were seeing didn't make any sense. Through a throbbing swell of sound and sensation, I think I became aware of the bass sirens winding up their howl. Instinctively, I raised my rifle, thumbed the safety to off, and took aim at the enormous bastards all in one smooth, automatic motion. From the corner of my eye, I saw Long Story do the same. Through the overwhelming wall of not sound, I heard the chopping of approaching black hawks, and then, suddenly, blessedly, nothing else. Late the following afternoon, I was shaken awake on a bed in the base hospital by a crisp, no-nonsense nurse. I was still in my full kit and armour. She ushered me to a counter, where another stern-faced nurse insisted that I sign a sheaf of papers on a clipboard. I've never been drunk or stoned in my life, but I felt like my hands and feet were being controlled by someone, someone who was only in distant contact. I couldn't see a long story anywhere, 
but I felt too stunned to ask about him. I stilted out of the main doors like a zombie in a horror film, and I almost fell into the passenger bay of a waiting Blackhawk. Sometime later, I was back in the underground, and all I could do was find my bunk before passing out. That was when the itching in my neck started to sting. 